Our next guest is Wendy Sue Swanson. She's a pediatrician, so it's doctor. Yeah? Dr. Wendy Sue Swanson. Somehow they left that off there. Imagine that. Um, she's a pediatrician, chief of digital innovation, and author of the, of the Seattle Mama Doc blog for Seattle Children's Hospital. Her career has focused on empowering patients, helping health care providers to do their jobs, strengthen communication between parents and patients and providers, excuse me. Dr. Swanson founded Digital Health at Seattle Children's Hospital in 2013, and she's here today to help us to learn how to use social media for good. <laughs> I want to start by telling you that um, uh, I love being <laughs> with teenagers. In fact, you're really kind of my favorite. I really like newborn babies, too but I really like teenagers. I was a middle school and junior high school teacher right after college. I did a program called Teach for America. So I taught bilingual education. I taught Spanish and English curriculum in Oakland, California. So I left college and went right into that, that, that school. During the year that I was a teacher, so that I'm old, I'm 44. So that was 1996 and we had a school shooting. One of my students was killed on the playground that year. We had fights in the hallways. We had like 45 kids in each classroom. We had weeks where we didn't have a bathroom. I mean, it was public education in the United States of America. It was awesome. And I learned so much um, about how to talk and really probably how to listen a little bit more. And of anything, that's the amazing thing about social tools is actually the listening that you can do. Um, I used to think when I started to do all this work in social media and media that it was really about me sharing all these ideas. And of course, I'm learning over time. It's really about listening to what people share and then figuring out actually what kind of what my fingerprint is. So you guys have all heard of a digital footprint? Yeah. I was like, Ehh. like everyone's telling you what not to do and what not to put online. Um, I would actually give you one other thing to think about. When anyone's talking to you about digital footprint, you should listen really carefully, right? We can get ourselves into trouble, and I have done it recently. I'll tell you a story about that later. Um, but you also have this really profound ability now in life to have a digital fingerprint to be just exactly who you are more and more for the world, for good. For you, for your family, for kind of emboldening your ideas and even really probably finding a sense of community and belonging. Because if anything I've learned being a pediatrician and being a mom and being a daughter and being a cancer survivor myself, of anything I'll tell you is that we all are seeking a great sense of belonging. And for the first time in the United States, in the last few censuses that we've taken, right? We take a census, we figure out how many people live in the United States, we figure out how long they live, and we figure out how they die. And for the first time ever, for Caucasian Americans, which is different, so for um, underrepresented minorities, for African Americans and Hispanic Americans, life expectancy is increasing, which is awesome. And for the first time ever, life expectancy for Caucasians is decreasing, which is kind of grim. And when you look at the main causes of that, it's death by suicide, it's fatty liver disease secondary to alcoholism, and it's overdoses related to opioids. So there's something about loneliness, a lack of connection, a reach out for different things that take our sense of belonging even away when we're kind of seeking it that's probably really profoundly changing our lives. But okay, so I was saying when, we, when I was in the back with Danielle, I was saying I'm a little bit more nervous talking to teens than I am talking to anybody else. But I want to go over kind of five topics, and I have a couple of quiz questions for you. And then I'll tell you a little bit of what I do. I'll just tell you, so I work in news media, so I work for NBC affiliate in Seattle. I was the first pediatrician blogger in this country for a hospital. I've written over 800 blog posts. I'm on YouTube, I'm on Twitter, I'm on Instagram, I'm on Facebook. And for the last 10 years, I've been trying to convince other doctors to be in those places, knowing full well that people want information, that you go online. Eight out of 10 Americans, doesn't matter if you're 18 or 17 or 82, eight out of 10 Americans on a monthly basis are going online to search for information about health. 
and teens, a huge report that was published just this year called the Hope Lab Report, found that more than ever, teens are going online looking for each other. And if you're depressed, if you score high on a depression inventory, or if you're anxious, more likely that you're going online looking for other people, looking for peers, looking for belonging, and looking for education. So I was thinking even about the question that came up to this mic, I think in one of the sessions, asking about, you know, can you get more education on transgender, gender, like a non-binary or gender confusion or disorientation or gender neut neutrality? And one of the things we know is that the most, one of the most important things for a child who feels that they were born with a different gender than the sex they were born. So there's great research that says, you and I were born with a sex. I was born as a female sex body. I had two X chromosomes, and when I came out, I was born in Minneapolis, Minnesota in 1974. That was the sex of my birth. And most research suggests that when you're born, your gender has already been established too. But sometimes, probably only about 1% or 2% of the time, the sex that you're born with and the gender that you're born with are different. And that there's this profound challenge to a sense of belonging and identity that comes about in life as you figure that out. So some people will start to really identify with their gender as early as age three. Most kids are starting to identify with what gender they have at age six. But a lot of people in our population haven't even figured out what their gender is in totality until late in adolescence or early adulthood. So if you're a teen and you're questioning anything about your sexuality or anything about your gender, it's normal. Your brain isn't fully formed until you're, does anyone know? I'm so excited. Thank you for the participation, first of all. 24, somebody said it over here. Yeah, woohoo! Yeah. <laughs> so your brain still has a lot of work to do. Mine's just getting old and like Swiss cheesy, but like yours is still like priming and growing and doing all these things. Okay, so five things that I really wanted to talk about are the, things that, the themes that you talked about. And I just thought I'd give you a little bit of information. I have lots of blogs I've written, but I also know lots of content that other people have written. So one of the things I was thinking, I created a list on the plane last night of some of the, list, the sites that I like. So if anybody wants any of these sites afterward, just pick me on Twitter or Instagram or wherever, and I'll get it to you, or I'll just, you guys can send a list. Um, let's do my first poll question. <laughs> do you have a parent or adult in your life who texts and drives with you in the car? And I know we've reviewed this, and thank you for your summaries about it. So I know what the data shows. I know what national surveys show on this, but I'm just curious to see what you guys... <laughs> So that's about right. Um, you know, I think most of us, all parents, when you have a kid, you're always like, to, and your parents, you know this, like you're kind of, you're always going to look up to your parents in some ways. You're always going to want to please your parents in some ways. You always want a good relationship with your parents. And what your parents say and do or don't do or don't say means a lot. I mean, so much of what I've come to do with my own children were some of the vacancies I felt from my own parents. That's the amazing thing about getting older and making your own families. <laughs> you can take the things that like put holes in you and give them to the people in your life and you can build your own family. So whatever vacancy you feel, you get to build that at times. But our parents don't do a very good job modeling, right? So we actually have laws. So recently in the state of Washington where I live in Seattle, um, we've changed laws, and for the first time, our texting rates are actually going down. But about 58% of car crashes for those between the age of 16 and 19, so early drivers, you're the most dangerous driver that you'll ever be when you're 16 to 16 and a half. Your first six months of driving are the most dangerous. So when you get in the car with your buddy who's in their first six months of driving, if you're allowed to do that, do you guys have graduated driving laws in New Hampshire? Do you know what that means? Like, can you, can you drive friends around? If you get your license today, can you go drive somebody? One person for like six months? And then, it, and then it goes up and then whatever, yeah. So during that time, that's the, mo I mean, that's the scariest time to let your friend drive you, okay? Now, a couple of reminders about that. 58% of car crashes happen when someone is using a phone within the 60 seconds before the accident. So it's a finger-waggy-like thing, but it, it's real that that model you know, really matters. So can we go to the next polling question? I know what the, I'll tell you what the national number is. I, I wanna see what you guys think. So. Pretty common. <laughs> I think you've probably seen the statistics. I don't know that they're all that con con, you know, convincing, but I'll tell you, every single one of these devices on these phones is built to grab and hold your attention. In fact, so I work in Silicon, so I'm a chief medical officer of a company in Silicon Valley. So half my time I spend in Seattle, half my time I spend in Silicon Valley. And I've been to Facebook campus, and I was on a call this week with Pinterest, and I've been with the heads of these technology companies. And let me tell you something of anything that these technology companies are doing is they are buying your attention 
and they are hiring the smartest people who can employ the most inventive strategies to grab and hold your attention. So the reason that you grab your phone when you're driving is that it has been engineered to do that to you. You have to actually fight against your biology. So have you heard of dopamine? Yeah. Right, so you know, like there's a dopamine surge every single time your phone goes dink. And do you know how when you get a text message if you have an iPhone, two minutes later you get it again? Yeah, I mean, why, right? They just want you to pick up your phone. Pick up your phone, pick up your phone, pick up your phone. Hey, you didn't pick up your phone. Right? That little badge, that little red badge, that blue color of that square, that scrolling, every single thing that's been in there has been designed to grab your attention and to hold your attention. So that your friend is texting and driving is kind of, it's hardwired. Every time something beeps, every time something gives them a little scroll, every time they feel a little blessing that somebody had their attention or thought of them. It's like, you know when you see a ladybug on the windshield and someone's like, someone who loves you is thinking about you. Now you have Facebook. It's like ding, 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 ding. It's like ladybugs everywhere, right? Now, there are some people who, the, the designer of the like button, the designer of the scroll function, and the designer of the badges came together for, a, for an entire organization to say, we maybe shouldn't be designing technology like this. Like, it might not be good. So I'm just gonna tell you, you've probably heard compartmentalization is key. So in the car, for example, one of the things you can do is the whole do not disturb function, right? That goes automatically when there's an, because there's an accelerometer inside your phone, and if it goes a certain speed, you can turn it so it always goes when you're driving. You can hold your friend's phone if they'll let you when they're driving, but you're gonna have to fight against it because you're, we're not, we're animals. We're complete animals, and these devices are only gonna get better and better and better at grabbing our attention and taking our time. I mean, you know, you, if you have an iPhone, you have screen time functionality now, right? Have you employed it and look at it? Yeah. It's really grim, right? 48 hours a week. <laughs> 48 hours a week? Yeah. Well, you probably do a lot of socializing and communicating on that. In fact, Common Sense Media Group that looks nationally at how teens communicate for the first time ever says that now teens say they communicate by texting more than they communicate in person. And like a bunch of old people could tell you that you're doing something wrong. I don't know that you're doing something wrong. I just know that you're doing something differently. But that these devices are going to kind of capture your attention in, in a really meaningful way. Okay, this is my next one real quick. It's interesting. The national data which is now a year old, actually says if you ask teens who've been driving in the last month, you know, have they been texting or driving, it's about 42% will say that, but it's all self-reported, just like it is right now. So, you know, it's, it's like if you ask anyone about um, how well they perform, most people will say that they kind of perform better than Mother Teresa in tasks of honor and decency and like all sorts of things. So we usually have a much better regard for ourselves than we do for those around us. So the data that our parents texted the most, our friends texted the second most, and we text kind of the, the same, you know, a little bit less isn't surprising, but about 50-50. Um, so you know the statistics. I don't really know how to make it compelling to you, except that just like you were sharing, Alex, is your name Alex? No. Aaron. Aaron, yeah. You were sharing, I think, when you were summarizing that, you know, car crashes are certainly affected by texting and driving more than we think even being under, under the influence of other substances. So, of course, you know, teenagers die two ways most commonly. Do you guys know what the two leading causes of death for teenagers are? Suicide and, and car accidents, right? So um, ending your life based on really profound suffering and mental illness is the first reason. And the second reason is just kind of not thinking it through, getting yourself into a really fast moving vehicle that's extremely dangerous on the road with all sorts of other people that are too, and then kind of being in a perilous situation. So there are some things that can make it much safer. So if you have ADHD or if your friend has ADHD and you know that, they shouldn't be driving without their meds. Great data that if you're a new driver, and you have ever been prescribed stimulants or medicines to help you with your attention and focus, you should never drive without them. So it's one thing that'll help, because it's all about keeping focus. Those graduated driving laws, right, are so you don't get totally distracted. We know that boys tend to be more distracting to each other in cars. They tend to have more hard time driving. And then who's the number one person that calls when you're driving? Your mom. Yes. <laughs> Great data that it is actually your parents' fault. So you go home tonight and you like take out that finger and you say there was this doctor from Seattle, she seemed to think she knew something, it's your fault. But it is, so the number one far outpacing when teens get other calls is their parent and of course you feel really compelled to answer the phone because it's your mom. Like if you're in the right place or the wrong place, you're still gonna answer the phone, right? So you know, 
don't answer the phone when your mom's calling and make an agreement beforehand, right? So if you can make those agreements ahead of time and actually acknowledge that the people that are potentially causing you the most disruption are your parents is a, is a good way. Now, texting and driving is remarkably dangerous, about 23 times more likely to have a near miss or a crash because it has three layers of distraction. Okay, there's visual distraction, right? So obviously, like you're doing an email or you're looking at a text and you're not looking at the road, you're going 60 miles an hour, right? And in six seconds, you've gone six football fields, right? So if you're looking at something for six seconds, even if your peripheral vision, which at your age looks pretty good, you still are going a long distance potentially if you get yourself in trouble or something happens unexpectedly. So there's visual. Then there's mental distraction, right? The idea that you're not actually thinking about, I gotta be a driver on the road, am I going the right speed limit? Like who's that guy, why is that guy such a jerk? Uh -huh, uh -huh. Right, like there's that mental structure. If you're thinking about the email, you're thinking about the yucky comment that you just got or that you put something up on Instagram and no one has said a thing. <laughs> and I looked awesome. If that's happening, right, your mind's somewhere else, your eyes are somewhere else, and then your hands are somewhere else. So this kind of what we call kinesthetic or this action distraction. So those three layers of distractions make it probably the most distracting thing that we can do in the car. But there are other really bad things that happen when you're driving and not, and, and not to undermine them. So we spend a lot of time talking about texting and driving. And at any given time, studies in Seattle and actually have been replicated around the country have found that at any given time on the road when they have observers at intersections, on highways, cameras, 10% of the people are actively texting and driving. Like at any given time. It's not like, oh, one in 10 people goes out and texts and drives. It's just that at any moment on the road, 10 of every 100 people driving around are on their, on their cell phone or using it. So you just got to be, of course, really careful to that. And that laws will ultimately, although they seem annoying and fines, we have a $234 fine in our state now for texting and driving, and it has changed our numbers that way. But the other distractions, of course, are things like being under the influence. Don't ever let somebody tell you that they can smoke weed and drive a car. It's just not true. I mean, you're just not going to drive a car very well. If it's altering the way that you feel and it's altering the way that you think, it's going to alter the way that you react and, and respond to a car. Do you guys have Uber in most of New Hampshire or not? Yeah. But like not rural, some parts and not, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, the one, so I think ride shares are these amazing opportunities to have just like a pop-off valve if you get yourself in a bad situation. I think figuring out a way to have a stash of money in your family that is like an emergency fund for that or the magic word. Do you guys know about the magic word plan? So magic word plan is like, um, I always talk to teens in clinic about this. So with Paris to say, okay, let's say you're in a situation, you're in a lot of pressure, you're with somebody who really wants to drive you home, you're really uncomfortable say like you don't want to drive home with them. And you could have some sort of word that you call your parent or you text your parent that word and then they are your out. They call you, they say that you gotta come and get you, you're in trouble, you, they're, they're the problem, they're the excuse. They make it all up, it turns into whatever scene you want it to be. But if your word is like grapefruit, and you're like, oh my god, I hate grapefruit juice, and your mom's like, grapefruit! And that means, shit, I'm gonna come and get them! Then you've got an escape valve that nobody else needs to know. So think about an emergency plan. So if you get yourself in a situation that you don't think you can get out of, make the right choice. If there's any question in your mind that someone's been drinking alcohol, someone's had any kind of drug that changes the way they think, like you've kind of got this, op this opportunity to get out of it. Okay, that's my driving stuff. I love, uh, there's a great website that we can share if anybody cares about it with all this stuff on kind of teens and how to make it better. But um, the do not disturb is probably the other one. And then um, my last one is the grayscale. Do you guys know the grayscale trick on your phone? Okay, so here's my phone. I use my phone a lot. My, my, my screen time hours are not pretty. I don't know if you can see it in the camera. Can you see, where's the camera? Which one are we at, we're at that one? Okay, so see how pretty it is? There are all these things, and they're like, look, I've got a badge there, I've got a bad, red badge there, like somebody said something to me. I have 52,000 inbox emails right there. <laughs> That's real. And then I've programmed my phone to do this. You see it? Can you see it? It's really boring. It's black and white. Can't see anything on the badges. Like, I pick this stupid thing up, and you know what I want to do with it? Not much. So, if you're one of those people that's having a hard time getting off your phone, you can program your phone to do grayscale. So if I triple click on the side, this is an iPhone, I triple click on the side, and I can go from gray, and I can go back to color. I kid you not, it is super powerful to teach you how much those really smart, super hyper rich people are trying to steal your brain in Silicon Valley if you put your phone into grayscale. So if you are having a day where you're like, you can't get off the phone, you kind of like you're having, it's like there's nothing else really going on, you're on your phone, you're feeling miserable, you feel a little bit more sad when you're on the phone, and you want to change that, you can put it into grayscale. Does anyone want to do it now?
it'll take a grand total of 30 seconds. Okay, do you, if you have an iPhone, you can do it this way. If not, Google Grayscale My you know, Android or um, Google Phone. So you go into Settings, and then you go into General. So Settings is the little wheel, right? And then General is the other wheel that's in there. And on the first screen, is everybody there? So we're back to Settings. General, and then two chunks down is just the word accessibility in its own line. Are you guys with me? Okay, hit accessibility. Then scroll all the way to the bottom of accessibility. This is how hard the people that make these things make this. This is how hard they make it. They actually don't want you to have a device that doesn't take all your attention. Now at the very bottom it says accessibility shortcut. Do you see that? Okay, hit that. We're in our final screen. This is the final moment. Now see where it says color filters? It's the third thing down. You just click that, and there should be a little blue X next to it. Does anyone want me to repeat it? Are you good? Okay, now, if you go back home, you've got your color phone, and now if you triple one, two, three on the side, on the right, does it go all gray? Oh, so home button, thank you. Sorry, home button. And, did you, and do you triple click the home button? Yeah, and then it works with the home button. Super ugly phone, right? So just try it. You guys tell me, tweet me, DM me, whatever you want. I wanna know what you think, but I think when you're having like a bad day and everything's making you feel crinny carmy there, if you put it in gray, I don't think you'll think your phone is as sexy as you think it is in color. <laughs> and if you wanna have more control over your phone, if you wanna decide who takes your attention, that's your power. Take away all those super rich, super smart engineers and take them back. Okay, that's my section on distractions in driving. But the other things are like putting on makeup, eating food, almost as distracting as texting and driving. So if you were like driving around with one of those people who always wants to be eating or always wants to be putting mascara on while they're going down the freeway, that's, a, that's another thing to like, you know, try to save your life, that whole thing. Okay, I'm moving on to topic um, number two, if that sounds good. Okay. Can we put up um, the question? Okay, so this might actually even be how we define the word sexuality, which is actually a fairly personal thing to, to define. Um, what we know is that um, you know, we have different searching patterns depending on where our curiosities are. So we know teens, for example, who um, are confused about their sexual orientation, who have questions about their development or their body. So that could be about like contraception, sexual intercourse, body changes, to anything of what we were talking about earlier about kind of gender and sex matching up, meaning transgender or gender confusion at some times, are searching online. And when you look at um, LGBTQ teens, you'll find that their search patterns are different. So they're searching more about their sexuality online. They're also searching for peers and support. So if you find yourself searching because you feel more depressed or you know, you're more anxious, which I'm sure you've heard, right? When we're questioning who we are and how we fit into culture and we're concerned about people judging us or we're concerned about being bullying, that we're likely to be searching online more. But I think one of the things that I, I, I just wanted you guys to know, the data is also really clear that we can get really, it can be really distorted what you find online, right? We don't know who the speaker is all the time but the way that it leaves us, us feeling. I think in high school, for example, we have some of the lowest teen pregnancy rates now that we've had in a long time. Kids actually do a really great job. So if you look at sexually active girls who are um, in the end of high school, 99% of them will say that they've been using contraception, mo contraception most of the time, right? You typically have access to get information if you do decide to become sexually active, but I think you can also get steered to believe that everybody's doing something that you're not. Like that whole concept when, you know, you guys were debriefing about the eating disorders information, how we feel portrayed against all sorts of other people really matters. But for example, you know, when it comes to even what we call sexual debut, do you know that term? That's, that's the first time. So that's, and that's the first time that you have sexual intercourse, but it's called sexual debut. That's the medical term. But when it happens, I think, can get really distorted. I think lots of people feel like everybody in high school is having sex, when in reality, more than ever, your generation is having less sexual intercourse in high school than ever before, making different choices, connecting in different ways, and actually deciding to have sexual intercourse later. So by the time people graduate from high school, about 55% of, of teens have reported having sexual intercourse. That's a flip of a coin by the end of high school. That means if you're looking around high school, everybody isn't having sex 
In fact, only half of them are having sex by the time they leave high school. So if you're questioning yourself or you're wondering or you have worry about it, don't let kind of the distortion of kind of what's selling to you, right? Because lots of people are selling ideas to you online. But it can, I think, actually really change kind of your perception there. Um, I was just going to say, finding out what's normal. Um, there's a really awesome site called Consent 101. I don't know if anyone's heard about it, it just teaches about consent. Like, how do you figure out? I think boys and girls, as they and, and as you grow up into adulthood, are trying to figure out different rules around engagement of sexual intercourse. And, and there are some great resources online. So when, when folks were talking early, kind of pitching that you wanted more education and health class in schools, you don't even have to wait for your schools to do this. You guys can share these kind of links with each other. But Consent 101 is a really good one. Planned Parenthood has amazing free resources online, too. So I don't know if you're aware of that. You can have free texting consultations at Planned Parenthood. You can even, in some states, have free video conferencing with Planned Parenthood professionals. Totally private, totally confidential. But access to you, you don't have to wait for other people to do it. You can find that online. Um, I don't, do you guys know the Trevor Project? You guys heard of the Treasure Project? So that's for um, transgender and LGBTQ, but great resources online. And again, with transgender, you know, we know about 40% of people who question their sex matching, their gender over their time, will actually think about ending their life, have such profound loss of belonging, such profound depression or anxiety or mental illness. The 40% number is, for me, like kind of just profound. So there are great resources to kind of feel better. And the most important thing that we do for people in our lives anywhere who express a feeling of disassociation in some ways is acceptance and non-judgment. 57% of transgender people say that someone in their family refuses to talk to them, which is kind of like a horror show, like a loss of communication. So um, that's probably the most important thing you can do as a friend or as someone in, in someone's class or classroom environment. Um, okay, let's do another poll. Next one. All right, that's pretty consistent. So um, that's exactly the national average, <laughs> a third um, of most US households. Kids will say they have access to a firearm. So gun control, you guys have mentioned a couple of times in the room, at least while I've been in here today, is one part that's an adult responsibility. And yet at the same time, think of like March for our lives, right? Like think of what teens have done in this country in the last two years. It's absolutely remarkable. So think about you know, Emma Gonzalez, who kind of led the voice for you know, March for Change and March for Our Lives. You know, within a matter of one month, she had like 1.2 million followers on Twitter. And the National Rifle Association at that time had 600,000 followers on Twitter in like one month in February of last year. So we do live in this profound time where you can take your voice and a person, hopefully not a personal tragedy, but a personal experience and really connect. So the reason I, I ask you the question about firearms is not to get in a, in a political conversation, but for you to really understand what it means for you in your school and with people that you love and your friends. So I was sat in one of the groups talking really about violence at school and some issues came up really about men mental health and anguish and reporting when you think about violence or you think about concern. What we know is that, you know, if we know that we have higher rates of depression and intention to end life or suicide in our teens than ever before. Between the year 2008, when you guys were like fourth grade, right? So from the time that you were in like fourth grade or second grade until the time now, the amount of kids who have shown up in hospitals to the, into the emergency rooms and been hospitalized overnight for trying to end their life by suicide or for severe depression that required them being in hospital has doubled. So there are twice as many children in this country that we're taking care of as pediatricians than before. So it's really different. And the relationship with firearms is really important. When someone tries, when someone is in, has such serious mental health challenge and they're hurting so much and they're feeling so lonely that they consider ending their life on their own volition, nine out of 10 times if they get access to mental health support, if they get access sometimes to medications that help them think in a different way, if they start to change their sleep habits so they get restorative sleep at night, if they exercise, if they're connected to their teens, or their friends and their family and others in their real life but also in their social network, if they go and see a mental health counselor, nine out of 10 times after someone has tried to end their life, they say they're so glad that they survived. Nine out of 10 times. So we go from a place of agony to a place of great comfort that once connected and once the mental health challenge is really recognized that you don't want to happen. You don't want to have ended the life that you potentially tried to end. When you attempt to end your life with a firearm, you are successful nine out of 10 times. 
The number's the same, but in the totally wrong direction. It's just such a lethal way when you're in such anguish and you're by yourself and you feel lonely. So number one, you can use any search engine at any time, but Google is the number one. If you ever are concerned and you don't know a crisis helpline or someone you don't know, all you have to do is type in the word thinking about or suicide, and the number one hit anywhere in the world based on where you're putting that in of a number to get your help. But the second thing that all of us can do, and this is not just for teens, this is for everybody, is ensuring that if you live in a home or you know someone who lives in a home with a firearm, who has access to it. We know that you're nine times more likely to end your life by suicide if you have access to a firearm, if, you're, if you have mental health challenge. So if you have anxiety, diagnosed or not, depression, diagnosed or not, or suicide ideation, what you really wanna do is make sure that that firearm, if it's in the house, is ideally out of a house, or it's locked in a you know, fire safe or a trigger lock with ammunition stored separately. I do believe it's one of the most important things that we do with mental health is just ensuring that the environment that we live when we're really struggling and we feel really low is a safer environment. So if you're thinking about anyone in your life and you think that they're depressed or anxious and you know that there are firearms in the house, one of the things you can do, which is a hard conversation to have, is to think about maybe not having those in the house. But with social good, I'll tell you this. So there's lots of studies looking at teens, and you've probably heard all about like how smartphones ruined a generation. There was a big article in the magazine called The Atlantic. It was one of the most viewed magazine articles of all time. It was written like a year ago. And it was all about how since 2010, when the iPhone came out, all the teenagers' lives are ruined because of social media. Well. It's probably not exactly right that in some ways we're deeply connected. We can build great intimacy with our friends in text. We can build intimacy with the communication things and images that we share. Um, and particularly, if we are mildly, moderately, or even severely depressed or anxious, so if we do a quick screening on you and we find out that you are, your experience with social media can be really, really good and really, really important. And that kind of brings me to a couple of my next questions. But that your connection in your social network might actually be a really sustaining part of your belonging. So can we do the next? Um... So since last year, the American Academy of Pediatrics has recommended that every single kid 12 and up is screened formally for depression every single year because we have these kind of crazy new numbers that people just don't feel so good in the United States right now. Yeah. Yeah, and so a screening, so this doesn't surprise me at all. It's just so disappointing. Um, well, how many people, yeah, yeah. So a formal screening typically involves this. So this is what you are due. So if you're not getting this, <laughs> um, and, and my hope tomorrow when I talk with legislators and pediatricians and clinicians and, and folks around the state who are so invested in listening to what you guys are guiding them to do, um, is making sure that we are kind of formalize that. So it's typically a questionnaire. There's a really simple questionnaire that's like two questions, and then there's another inventory that's eight or nine questions. You usually fill it out literally on a piece of paper. Sometimes fancy clinics have it on like an iPad or something. Um, most people should be screened for it every year. And the reason being, a second study after we kind of published that data in pediatrics really on how many kids are depressed and why are they, you know, with this doubling of the hospitalizations, a second study was published just last month that found 50% of parents who had children who were thinking about suicide didn't know about it. So it's not uncommon that you may not have confided in a parent with a really desperate sense of disbelonging or loneliness or suicide ideation or um, thinking about death. 75% of parents who had children who were reporting thinking about death, so not thinking necessarily about ending their own life, but kind of thinking a lot about death, 75% of parents didn't know that. So this is one of the ways that this is going to change, but this is a bummer. <laughs> I think you all deserve to be screened. I think we all deserve to be screened every single year. And so if you haven't and you're ever concerned about, you, you should go and do that. And the other thing I'd like to say is therapy is awesome. Therapy is awesome. Therapy is awesome. Like, I can't say that enough. And therapy can happen a couple of times, and therapy can happen for a couple of years, or therapy can happen for a couple of decades. But we're wired in ways that make us vulnerable at times. Depression runs in families. Depression runs at different times in our life, for example, around pregnancies, around times of change, around a loss, having a big breakup, having a change, having a divorce in your family, having a move, having a really bad performance on an exam. It's real. <laughs> But therapy is really awesome. So it is helpful. It is always confidential. And getting access to it can sometimes be a hard time. But there's more and more telemedicine that's coming, too, where you can actually get in touch with a therapist online. 
Um, okay, I'm going to go to the next question in the poll. Oh, this is just about use pattern. Okay, sorry, I was thinking it was the next one. Okay, well, let's do this. I just want to see what you say. So this is, when you have access to your phone or computer on average, how often do you use it? So like not when you're at school, you probably can't use it, right? Like when you're in class or whatever. But when you have full access to it, do you use it every hour? Do you use it every day? Yeah, it's usually like 78 to 85% will say that they use it every hour. And some people actually say that they're kind of constantly connected. So 20, 20 some percent of people who are a little bit anxious or depressed will say that they're kind of always and constantly all throughout the day online. Um, but every hour makes um, a ton of sense. It's certainly a part of our lives. But that's why that grayscale is going to be your friend if you don't want to be so connected to that. Um, OK, and then my, I think I have one last little poll question. Thanks for participating, everyone. So this is if you've ever been denied access to your cell phone or internet as punishment. So I bring this up because in clinic, I have seen kids get in a lot of trouble, particularly when they're depressed or they're anxious. And then everyone over the age of 14 deserves time with a pediatrician all by themselves. So your parent should be kicked out of the room at some point. You deserve a confidential relationship. Usually when mom and dad is out of the room, right, that's like the sex, drugs, rock and roll stuff that we talk about. <laughs> that's exactly what we talk about when we get them out. And every parent will lean over and say, well, I'm really close. I don't need to leave. And I'll say, like, bye. <laughs> So, and we all know, you tell us, thankfully, if you have a good relationship with your healthcare provider, I hope you do. If you don't, maybe try to find a new one and, or open it up. But, you know, that's when we, when we have kind of these, these real conversations. But I'll often see parents taking phones away from children who are under great distress. And I have to tell you, I'm on your side on this. I don't think that that's a great punishment, particularly when your sense of belonging or a sense of loneliness is kind of part of what your pain is. So if that is part of where you're really uncomfortable in life and that's the punishment, I want you to speak up and I want you to advocate for yourselves as best as you can. That I don't think disconnection for you um, is ever what you need. And I'm not here to finger wag and tell you just to get off your phone. I want you to be off your phone when you want to be off your phone. I think you should be off your phone an hour before you go to bed. I don't think you should sleep with your cell phone. Well, most of us do. <laughs> it's like 70% of United States residents now sleep right next to their cell phone. But you can put the do not disturb on really easily, which will save you some time. We know that actually texting and sleep, that that's not just the blue light, but it's actually the interactivity with your brain that actually makes it harder for you to sleep. And you're going to be a nicer person. You're going to do better at sports. You're going to be a better friend. And you're going to do better at school if you actually get eight or nine hours of sleep like you're supposed to. And the cell phone's only going to get in your way. But I do, I do not think that you should them be deprived of your connectivity usually. I know there are like outlier reasons, but I'm just kind of on your side in that behalf. Um, what, can, what else can I answer? I mean, I can keep drabbling on, but like, is there anything I can answer as a person who uses all these tools and likes them? The question is really, let's say you go and you break some sort of rules, you behave poorly in some social network, you either get blocked or you are harassing or we, we haven't gotten into like bullying. And I mean, I've been bullied. We, I think many of us have been bullied online. Um, but you're a bullier, let's say, and, uh, and I'm kind of saying you should be attached to your phone. So there's probably a code of conduct that has to be built, right? But, you know, I was just reading a little bit about, like, this was a new term for me because I'm such an old lame -o, but, like, the whole, like, um, the Rinsta and Finsta, these mean things to you, don't they? Look at me. I know. I'm like an old person. I learned about that today. So an, a Rinsta is a real Instagram account, right? A Finsta is a fake Instagram account. Who has a Finsta? Oh, my God. Who has a Rinsta? Oh my God. And so like, do people know this is your Rinsta, this is your Finsta? Yeah. Does it say it in your bio? No, no you just know it. And so like, if I'm your aunt, I follow your Finsta? No. I follow the Rinsta. Yeah. I see. So all my nieces and nephews, I'm in the Rinsta, and then there's some other creepy account. And in the creepy account, so like in the creepy account, you can have like bad behavior and it's not as pleased. Now, a lot of people, well, I think a lot of people would say, the nanny state isn't really ideal. That actually, it's really following along. Like you, it's kind of like your parents guiding you and helping you understand when you feel really good and when you feel really bad. But I mean, there's an exception to every rule. So I think if there's really bad behavior and there's a code of conduct that has been broken, I think absolute retraction of a certain, certain social network is appropriate. Um, and building trust back, you know. But I, but I worry that the idea that that works um, is kind of infantile. The idea that a a smart teenager can't go around it and make a new email to get a new account. I mean, like that. So if somebody wants connection and will use a digital tool to do it, you'll figure it out. Like if anything, you know, um, I, think, I think kids know that. That's, that's my very quick answer to that. 
It's a great question. So her question was, if you don't have access to a therapist or a behavioral health counselor, is it a good idea to use social media? And I'd say, I feel like it's a good idea for you to be yourself online. So everybody has their own spectrum of privacy. You know, I'm an unusual doctor. I go out and talk about vaccines and contraception and, and parenting my kids and midlife and all these things, and other people may not want to do that. When I'm having a bad day, I say so. When I've done something I feel proud of, I say so. But I, I'm always kind of self-evaluating and self-critical. Um, you know, I think we set ourselves up for vulnerability when we share a lot of personal information in a social network, particularly if we know, and of course we always remember, anything we share can be quickly copied and shared somewhere else. So nothing anywhere ever on a digital device is private. It just isn't. And the most trustworthy people in the world can behave poorly in a moment. And so I think we have to th think about that. But I think we all have a different line of where our privacy is. And I think our, the younger generations, like your generation and things, have a, actually a, a much more wider margin of um, pri privacy, like not as restricted from a privacy standpoint. But I think it can be really intimidating to share something that's really vulnerable and have it kind of go out of control. And of anything that we all know, anything you share online can go right out of your hand pretty quickly. So. It can be a dangerous thing to do, but data from the Hope Lab report, the, a big report that was like an 85-page report, talked a lot about teens going online and finding other teens like them who were suffering from anxiety and depression, finding great, like 70% of them, finding great social support by finding other people who were like them and had experiences like them, and that that peer-to-peer -peer relationship of like, hey, this made it better for me, hey, this is good for me, that that was actually really um, a rejuvenative place. So I would never say hard line, like, no, you shouldn't go online and get social support. Like, why wouldn't we? We're like human beings. Like, we want connection that way. So when I'm having a bad day, I use, does any does anyone, do any of you guys use Marco Polo? I'm like, yeah, I love Marco Polo. Do you like Marco Polo? It's like a, yeah, it's a video sharing app, but four of my friends from college and I talk almost every day on Marco Polo. And like, a couple of our parents have died, one of our college roommates has died. We actually do all sorts of social support by just being able to share a video here and there at a different, we're both, we're all busy, we live all over the United States. Um, but it's really meaningful to me. And, and um, it's not totally private. I was thinking about it. I was, in a, I was featured in an article in the press about my work, and I mentioned something about Marco Polo, and the Marco Polo people reached out to me, and I thought, God, are they listening to what I was just saying on Marco Polo to my friends? Like, <laughs> probably. You know, like, we know the technology companies are not looking out for our social welfare. I mean, I think they want to, and they're trying to, but it's not their first and foremost. That what they want is users, and what they want is data, and that what they want is your data and your user, and they care more about your data than they care about you. So... I'm going to do his hand, and then I'll come back here. Uh, um, that's a hard question. So he said, when you're talking and trying to support someone who might be thinking about ending their life with suicide, what are some of the th questions, the kind of standard questions? So first and foremost, I'd ask them if they're alone. I'd ask them what, what, what they've been thinking about and how they feel. I'd rem I'd also remind them that they're not, that you care about them. Um, I would remind them um, that they that they are other places to seek support, and I would remind them that they won't always feel this way, that there are temporary, there's temporary agony in life. And that's one of the things that when, when you're dealing with someone who's an extremist, is reminding people that kind of we come through these different undulations kind of in our moods and behaviors. Is there, do you have a better recommendation, a better answer? You're like formally trained, I know, because I've heard you say it a couple times today. You're probably more trained than I am. Yeah, so can I repeat that a little bit? Just some, so it's, a, it's an analogy almost like when you're, if you see a seven-year-old drowning, your first instinct of what you do is the wrong thing to do. So if you saw a seven-year-old and you thought the seven-year-old was out in the water and didn't look like they could swim, your first instinct might be to jump in, right? And what can happen in that situation is you both can drown. And your second instinct is the right one, which is you kind of throwing them right, a flotation device, like a little buoy or something to hold on to, and or in this case, if you're coaching someone or listening to someone who's in a really bad place to say, I'm not a mental health professional, I'm not an expert, but I'm going to get you one, and I'm here with you until we do, right, almost like a bridging support that way. I like that answer a lot. I don't know if that, yeah, you. It's hard, it's hard for me to get in, the, in between you and your dad, uh, but I will say, I think you probably need to make clear in your home and in your family kind of um, what being a good citizen means. And when you're not a good citizen, what do you not have access to? Typically, phones from the, the parent viewpoint are thought of as kind of devices of privilege, 
which on some level they are. They cost a lot of money. They're really expensive devices. But at the same time, they can, it can be really socially isolating and concerning to a teen's lifestyle in today's environment. And that's where I feel your pain. Um, but I think it's probably worth saying, what can I do to rebuild your trust to get this back sooner so that I'm not so isolated? And how can I make sure that I understand the house rules? If your dad doesn't want you to smoke pot, you should understand why he doesn't think that you should do that. And then you should understand how you can or cannot follow that rule. But that code of conduct is, I think, really, really important. So I think we're out of time. Thanks, you guys, for participating and for doing all the polls and everything. Thank you.